Well, greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, while we give everybody a moment to join, um, why don't you uh, get in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from today and what uh, we're in the middle of spring migration here. It's really starting to ramp up. Tell us what, uh, what cool new birds you've been seeing in your area in the last week or so. Janet said Geneva, New York is in the house. Can they go New York? Buffalo, David Baker seen some bald eagles around. We got Newton, Connecticut, Rochester. New Haven, Gene and Buffalo saw a pheasant. Nice. New Canaan, Bristol. Wild turkeys in Rouses Point. White-throated sparrows are coming through in uh, Roosevelt Island, New York. Pine Warbler back in Meridian, Connecticut. All right. Well, everyone, hi. My name is Rich Merritt, and I'm, I'll be your uh, long-winded host today. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Audubon State Offices of Connecticut, New York, whose mission it is to protect birds and the places we all need in our forests, on our coasts, and across local communities. A quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will soon be available on our YouTube and Facebook pages, and questions are welcome in the chat box at any time, and we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. Um, today's webinar is about the impact of neonic pesticides and what we can do about it. And with us today to present on this topic is Dan Rochelle, the acting director of the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council's Pollinator Initiative, which focuses on protecting our nation's bee populations from the ever-growing threats to their health and existence, in particular, the use of bee toxic pesticides. Thanks for joining us today, Dan, and welcome. Um, well, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Dan Rochelle. I'm acting director of NRDC's Pollinator Initiative, and I wanted to talk a little bit today about neonicotinoid pesticides, or neonics for short, uh, and a bill in New York, uh, the Birds and Bees Protection Act, that would clean up neonic pollution in New York State. I know we have some Connecticut folks on the phone today as well. Uh, so also want to give a shout out to SB 120, uh, which would do um, similarly clean up neonic pollution in Connecticut. Um, I know it's a bird crowd, uh, but just by way of background here, I wanted to start with the humble honeybee. I think folks here probably know that bees are important. They're responsible for one out of every three bites of food that we eat. And to give you an illustration of that, here is your typical grocery store today in a world with bees. And here is what that grocery store would look like in a world without bees. So certainly we would still have food. We would just have a lot less of it. It would be likely more expensive and we wouldn't have the same options. A lot of the most delicious and nutritious foods would disappear. Beyond the grocery aisle, uh, bees and other pollinators, including birds, are exceptionally important for ecosystem health. So about 80% of the world's terrestrial plants, plants on the face of the earth, require um, some pollinator, some animal pollinator, whether that's a bee or a bird or something else, to reproduce. So if we see losses of pollinators, we see not only issues with food security, but also potentially the collapse of whole ecosystems. And that is basically what we are worried about these days. Um, about 17 years ago, beekeepers in New York, Connecticut, and across the country saw their annual losses of honeybee colonies suddenly shoot through the roof. Up until that point, beekeepers had been seeing losses 10, 15% a year, uh, mostly in the winter and that shifted to 40, 50, 60% a year um, happening year round. And as you can see, um, those high level of losses have persisted to this day. Actually last year was the second worst year on record in terms of annual losses of honeybee colonies. Uh, it's important to note that honeybees are not the only bees out there. Um, they're actually not even native to the US. Um, they are managed like livestock. There are 4,000 species, however, of native bees in the US, over 400 in New York alone. And here's a bee that would have been fairly common in New York and Connecticut um, as recently as the mid-1990s. 
But that bee, uh, which is the rusty patch bumblebee, has lost about 90% um, of its habitat since that time, has not been seen in either state since the mid-2000s, and was the first bee placed on the endangered species list uh, in the continental United States. So we, we know that what is happening to honeybees in large part is also happening to a lot of our native bees and not just native bees, um, also all of our other sorts of, of flying insects. Um, this is a piece from the New York Times Magazine a couple of years ago talking about the in insect apocalypse. It's maybe a little bit overplayed, certainly uh, if you like cockroaches, they'll be around for a while, but we do see losses of certain types of insects and a loss of that um, biodiversity and the functions that they provide. So, you know, the question is, what's causing this mass loss of biodiversity? Certainly, uh, there are a number of factors. Climate change is an important one, as is loss of habitat to monocultural agriculture and urban and suburban sprawl. Uh, parasites and pathogens, here's a picture of a couple of varroa mite, uh, literally sucking the life out of a honeybee. It, it, those are the little brown specks, if you can see them on the bee. They are a problem for honeybees, not so much uh, for other bees. And last, but certainly not least, there are pesticides. And in particular, we are concerned about a class called neonicotinoids, again, neonics for short. And um, neonics are neurotoxic insecticides, which means they are pesticides designed to kill bugs by attacking their nerves. And we have three big concerns with this pesticide class. The first is that neonics are super duper toxic to insects. Just one neonic treated corn seed can have enough active ingredient to kill a quarter million bees or more. And since their introduction, neonics have made US agriculture 48 times more harmful to insect life. And as you can see, that jump in harmfulness starts at almost exactly the time we see the jump in losses of honeybee colonies right around the mid 2000s. And this is the only one of those stressors that maps so neatly like that. Second problem with uh, neonics is that they're very good at contaminating whole ecosystems. So by design, they permeate plant leaves, roots, pollen, nectar, everything. And the, the idea is that they make the plant itself poisonous to insects. They make the plant itself the pesticide. And that means they can be applied in all sorts of interesting ways. Of course, they can be sprayed like conventional, older conventional insecticides, and they are, but they are also probably more commonly painted, literally painted on crop seeds. And here is a picture of some neonic treated corn seed. Here's a close up of that seed. They don't always pick the same color, uh, but they do have to colorize the, the seed to show that there is a, a pesticide on it. And the idea is that as these plants are growing from the seed, they literally soak up that pesticide coating through their roots and become toxic to um, insects. The problem is only two to 5% of that coating actually gets into the target plant. The other 94, 95 plus percent stays in the soil where it persists for years. And anytime it rains, anytime there's irrigation, that rainwater or irrigation water will pick up the pesticides. They'll carry them through the soil to contaminate new soil. If there are plants with roots in that soil, those plants will soak up the pesticides. They'll become toxic, their pollen, their nectar. If there's a water supply nearby, that water supply becomes contaminated. Third problem with neonics is they're just so darn popular. They are all over the place. 100% um, or close to 100% of conventional corn is pre-treated with a neonic before planting. 50 to 75% of soybeans. So in New York state, you're already talking well over a million acres. Um, but they are also all over lawns, gardens, golf courses, you name it. And I don't have the stats for Connecticut, but here are the stats on neonic use in New York. I know 2014 isn't super recent, but it's the last year where we have good data. And um, I want you to pay attention in that bar, that last bar there to the red portion. 
That's the use of imidacloprid, just one of several neonics that are approved and not even the most used in New York. It's the second most used. This is a map of imidacloprid use across the US. And again, 2014 being the last year where we have good data. And what you'll notice is it's all over the place. And this is, again, not even the most ne used neonic in New York. And an important thing to note about this map, it's just agricultural use. It's not looking at the lawns, gardens, and golf courses. So if you included those, a lot of those white areas in New York, particularly on Long Island, Westchester, other places would be filled in. Um, so this just gives you a sense that because these pesticides are being used year after year after year in the same area, they persist for years in the soil. What's happening is you have a buildup of toxicity in the soil that is constantly expanding every time there's rain, irrigation, lawn watering, whatever. Uh, and that leads to sort of ubiquitous contamination of the environment, soil, water, plant life, et cetera. And we see that in New York. So in other states too, again, I just have the data for New York, but um, neonics are one of the most frequently de detected pesticides in the Long Island aquifer. They show up in about a third of samples there. Um, they show up all over New York surface waters at levels linked to the hollowing out and the collapse of aquatic ecosystems. And it's important to note that these water tests, again, just looking for imidacloprid, not the other neonics. So as bad as the contamination picture looks, it would be much worse if we had the full picture, which we do not have. Um, another important thing to note, uh, most conventional drinking water treatment systems do not remove neonics, uh, chlorination certainly doesn't, advanced filtration does, uh, but in New York, um, New York City and Syracuse have famously unfiltered water supplies, and actually most water systems don't, don't have that advanced uh, filtration technology. So uh, I won't talk about all of these harms. I know uh, Nicole is gonna talk about the birds, but it's worth noting that, um, you know, this, sort of massive ubiquitous contamination of our environment has impacts. Uh, the first that is that we know about, and again, sort of the canary in the coal mine here being honeybees, neonics are definitely harming bee populations. They're definitely a leading cause of the mass losses that we see. Um, that's fairly unequivoc unequivocal in the science. Um, when it comes to birds, um, again, as you might imagine, these pesticides are hollowing out the environment generally. So they do uh, affect insect life that birds eat. So fewer bugs, fewer birds, uh, and are directly toxic. Again, Nicole will talk more about all of this. Um, but it's also worth noting that there are similar effects for other species. So fish, for example, um, as you might imagine, when neonics get into aquatic ecosystems, they're also pretty good at wiping out invertebrate and insect life there. And, um, there was a good study in Japan that looked at the collapse of a sustainable fishery. And the study authors were looking at zooplankton. And these are zooplankton, if you're unfamiliar. And what they saw is that in the early to mid 90s, around May, 1993, they saw those zooplankton populations they were monitoring just hit a wall. And at the same time, unsurprisingly, the fish that ate those zooplankton also hit a wall and the catches for fishermen in that otherwise sustainable fishery went way, way down. The study authors later were able to link this to the introduction of neonics in nearby agriculture. And it's worth noting that the levels in that water supply measured match a lot of those seen in New York. And in some cases, the New York levels are higher. Um, it's also worth noting that neonics have some direct impacts to other species besides birds. Um, there was a good study that was inspired by some hunters seeing weird things going on with the deer that they had caught in the wild, and they did a controlled study to see whether neonics might be the cause of some of these um, you know, weird things that hunters were seeing with the deer that they had culled. And in a controlled study, they found that real world exposure or exposure to real world levels of neonics in the womb uh, were associated with deer that had deformed jaws, decreased organ weights, and increased rates of fawn mortality. 
So that's a little scary because deer are large mammals. So are we, uh, and we do have some human health studies uh, linking neonic exposures again in the womb to autism-like symptoms and also birth defects of the heart and brain. We also have some rat studies that show connections between neonic exposures and thinning of key areas of the brain, uh, reproductive effects. Uh, it's not on this slide, but I'll also note that some neonic uh, infused pet collars were also associated with the death of uh, over 1600 pets over the last 10 years. And all of this information uh, collectively is concerning because half the American population on any given day, according to CDC monitoring, has neonics in their bodies. Uh, so there is massive widespread exposure, which is maybe not surprising because we have massive widespread contamination of our environment. So if you add all of this up, um, it starts to look a little bit like Silent Spring, uh, Rachel Carson's prophecy um, back in the 60s of a spring that's devoid of buzzing insects and bird song and um, aquatic life, and also one that was damaging to our health. And if you talk to entomologists, the, the anecdote that they give you for what's going on with neonics is the windscreen test. So for those of us who were around in the mid 90s, if you were driving through a rural area, um, you might, in, you know, around summertime, August, you might have to turn on your windshield wipers, whether it was raining or not, just to get the bugs off of your windshield. And think, you know, when was the last time you really had to do that? And this is, this is sort of the, the one place where we can really visualize the impact that these pesticides are having. Um, we, can, we can see, I guess, the absence of it um, on our windshields. So um, just really quick, what have other folks done around the world? Um, the European Union has banned uh, the major uses of neonics, France has banned all of the neonic chemicals for use outdoors. Um, EPA is pretty much business as usual. They're likely to affirm a decision that would allow current levels of neonic use across the country, which will, as we know are, are damaging. Um, some of the states are stepping up and taking action. New Jersey and Maine just passed um, laws that would eliminate non-agricultural neonic uses, which is most of the neonic use in those states that don't have a lot of corn and soybean. Uh, Connecticut and Maryland and Vermont all took earlier action that sort of restricted neonic use to certified applicators, to certified professionals, but that would include most landscapers. So I know SB 120 uh, now in Connecticut would go a step further, uh, similar to New York and Maine, New Jersey and Maine. Um, but the bill that I really would like to highlight for folks, especially those living in New York, is the Birds and Bees Protection Act. It is a bill that's based on a report from Cornell University that looked at over 1,100 peer-reviewed papers on neonics, not just their harms to pollinators, but doing a cost-benefit analysis. And um, there are two big findings from that report. The first is that the neonic treated corn, soybean, and wheat seeds, which is about 75% of the neonic use in New York agriculture, pose substantial risk to pollinators. And we know birds, ecosystems, people, et cetera. But um, they provide no overall net income benefit to farmers. So to break that down a little bit more, very rarely do they provide a yield benefit. But even when they do, if you factor the extra cost of having the pesticide on the seed versus the benefit, it's a wash. Uh, the other big finding from that is the turf and ornamental uses, the, the um, lawn and garden uses, if you will, also not needed most of the time, not providing a benefit, but even when you might wanna use a pesticide, there are safer alternatives available. So the Birds and Bees Protection Act, um, prohibits those two categories of uses. They account for about 80 to 90% of all the neonics going into New York's environment every year. Um, it doesn't affect other agricultural uses besides those treated seeds. It allows for invasive species treatment against emerald ash borer. And there are a few other uh, sort of carve outs in the bill. But again, in the main, it would get rid of 80 to 90% of the neonics going into New York's environment every year. It would go a long, long way to um, cleaning up the environment and making it safer 
for bees and for birds. It'll, it'll take a few years because these pesticides, again, do last, but they do break down eventually. Uh, and so we really wanna pass this bill this year and we think we have a good chance. So um, for the folks on the phone who live in New York, we need your help. Um, the New York legislature ends June 2nd and a lot of the, the critical um, negotiations and wheeling and dealing is gonna be happening in, in the next several weeks, basically starting next week and going through May. So if you want to help pass this bill, um, Audubon has been really intimately involved in the coalition. Uh, there is a petition you can sign, um, uh, and I'm sure uh, folks here will, will get the link if they, if they want it. Um, but beyond just sort of clicking something that sends a message to your uh, legislators, which is important, incredibly important, if you wanna take the next step, you can find out who your legislators are uh, and contact them by email or by phone. You would be surprised how much a phone call matters. They do take track of the phone calls that they receive. It is incredibly impactful. Um, so I provide the bill number here if folks want to call their legislators and, and express their support for the bill. Again, the next several weeks is a critically important period. Um, for people that want to get even more involved, you know, writing a letter to the editor to your local paper is sort of another next step for those who um, uh, are, are writers and enjoy writing. Uh, and of course, you know, social media support, uh, spoke, uh, speaking with other groups, getting other folks involved are other ways to support the bill. So I know it's it's not question time, but I'll I'll stop there, and I will hand things over to. Nicole. Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much. Um, that was uh, sobering, but um, very, very interesting. And, and thanks for at least putting some some actions in there that we can all undertake to to help uh, maybe make the situation um, much better. Um, now joining us is, as Dan said, Dr. Nicole Michael from National Audubon Science Team. Um, Nicole, dig into the science behind. Uh, neonicotinoid pesticide impacts on birds. Dr. Michael is Audubon's Director of Quantitative Science and is based in Portland, Oregon. Um, she leads a team of scientists who produce the modeling efforts needed to understand trends, drivers, and spatial patterns in bird abundance, occupancy, and occurrence. And she's co-authored multiple papers on neo neonicotinoid pesticides and their impacts on birds and their insect prey. Um, welcome, Nicole, and thanks for joining us. All right, well, uh, thank you for the great introduction, Rich, and thank you, Dan, for, for a fantastic presentation, kind of setting the, uh, the baseline here uh, of some of the problems that we're seeing with, with uh, neonicotinoid, or what I refer to as neonic pesticides. And now we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into how they're affecting birds. Let me just start with uh, a, a quick introduction. Um, so I, as Rich just said, I'm the Director of Quantitative Science with National Audubon Society on our science team. Uh, I've been with Audubon since late 2015. Uh, I you know, lead a team of scientists who works on you know, many of these large scale analyses of uh, population trends and, and drivers, what's causing population trends, uh, in, including pesticides. I, I actually did uh, uh, my postdoctoral fellowship with um, someone familiar with the neonic world. You've probably heard of her name, Dr. Christy Morrissey. She's a, a neonic expert at the University of Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan looking at impacts of neonics on, on birds and their, especially their aquatic insect prey. And I've been working with birds for a long time and I'm based in Portland, Oregon with my, my two indoor cats and, and their catio. So there we go. Uh, as you, you know, have probably heard many times over the last few years, we are, we are in the midst of a massive decline of the North American avifauna. Uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, birds disappearing and uh, we are taking what steps we can in order to help bring them back. So across North America, paper and science a couple of years back showed that we've, we've lost 2.9 billion birds since 1970. That accounts to 29% to population loss over the last about 50 years. 
And many species are declining, but the most severe declines have been amongst the, the grassland birds that have lost over, over half of their population since 1970. Look at these population trends here. This, this figure is uh, drawn from Canada. Uh, this figure is from that same science paper. And we see that grassland birds and aerial insectivores are the species that are undergoing the strongest population declines over time. And again, the largest population losses across all of North America have very clearly been amongst grassland birds. Grassland birds that are in those areas, you know, especially of the, the Great Plains where uh, habitat has been lost and there is intensive uh, agricultural uh, expansion going on. So scientists like myself, like my team, you know, we, we have spent years, uh, you know, investigating an array of proposed mechanisms of, of bird population declines, including losses in, you know, insect prey, contaminants, uh, habitat loss, factors affecting birds on the non-breeding grounds, uh, as well as climate change, all of which can lead to uh, changes and, and declines in bird populations. So today we're going to focus on the contaminants, uh, specifically again on, on neonics, how they directly affect bird populations, as well as they indirectly affect them via impacts on, on their prey. So Dan did a great job of overviewing this, but I uh, just briefly to set up the stage here, uh, you know, talk about neonics. They are a class of uh, insecticides. There are, there are a handful of them uh, that are related to nicotine, uh, hence the name. They are most commonly applied as a seed treatment in these you know, often beautiful colors. Uh, and they also can be applied through a spray. And uh, these figures will look, uh, look familiar because Dan just showed them. Uh, but as you can see, the uh, spatial, uh, there's been a massive spatial expansion and use of neonics across the US uh, between 2000 and 2014. The same is true in Canada. This is a paper uh, we published a few years back uh, showing detections of neonics across the, the you know, bread basket of Canada. Uh, here too, here's another way you can see the, uh, the mass of neonicotinoids use and how it has expanded and grown exponentially uh, since the 1990s. And as a result of all these neonics in the environment, now when scientists go out and they, they sample surface waters, uh, you, they're getting detections up to 100% of samples that contain one or more neonics. And they're finding this especially during the planting season, which is May and June. And all of you birders know that that is also the peak bird breeding season. Uh, so that's when birds are, are really sensitive. And, and as Dan, you know, talked about, um, you know, these, these treatments, when they're applied to the seeds, you know, you think, great, they're going in the ground, no problem. You know, then they're being taken up by the plants. Well, it turns out that, you know, of all these neonics that are out there in the environment, only about two to 3% are actually taken up by the plants. And that is, you know, contributing this uh, five to 8% increase in crop yields. Uh, so it's a you know, fairly small increase for the investment that's going in. And it lasts typically only about two to three weeks. So that's two to 3%. You know, the rest of it, you know, two to 3% is lost as dust. So it's going into the air. Uh, and then the other 90% or more is going into the soil. And then it's you know, um, going into water that, you know, rain comes down and collects on the fields and then it washes into, you know, lakes or ditches or ponds. And so it's being absorbed by aquatic plants and then aquatic invertebrates are being exposed in the water and sediments. And those aquatic invertebrates, I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, essential part of the bird food chain. So let's start off and talk about routes of exposure. Uh, and specifically, we're going to talk about some of the, the direct routes by which birds can be exposed to neonics, including by eating seeds, as well as some of the indirect routes of exposure. So, you know, as Dan said, they have these seeds that are, you know, brightly colored, they're, they're planted, um, you know, except, uh, you know, 
farming is not always perfect. No, nothing is perfect, you know, and so 1% of the seeds typically remain on the surface. Sounds like a small number, but when you're talking about these massive amounts of, of seeds and chemicals going out there, 1% adds up pretty quick. Uh, studies have shown that about 25% of fields that they surveyed after planting still had spill seeds on the surface. And dozens of uh, wild bird species have been documented, you know, by observers, by camera traps, eating some of these spilled neonic treated seeds, including the, the species shown here. And so, you know, we know the birds can, can eat these seeds. Is it showing up in the birds? Yes, uh, there are many studies documenting exposure to neonicotinoids. Uh, we've seen 100% of Mediterranean gall and almost 90% of sandwich terns uh, have neonics in their feathers. Uh, farmland birds uh, have that were observed feeding in, sea, in fields that had been treated with uh, neonic clothianidin. Uh, blood samples from 91% of the birds contain the neonic. Similarly, uh, game birds um, that were in fields treated with clothianidin, uh, when they were sampled after the seeds had been sowed, 89% of the birds uh, had detections in their blood. Uh, wild caught white crown sparrows, just, you know, people went out in Canada and caught them, tested their blood, 78% had a midocloprid, uh, the neonic that Dan was talking about. Barn owls. Um, you know, we've seen neonex in 69% of nestling and 57% of adult barn owls. And hummingbirds too uh, don't escape. Um, over a quarter of hummingbirds that are sampled can, had neonex in their cloacal fluid. So, you know, there's, you know, the birds can be exposed through directly eating the seeds, but there are other possible routes of direct exposure. Uh, you know, these high detections in the hummingbird cloacal fields were actually highest uh, when birds were sampled near blueberry fields that have been sprayed with neonics, suggesting, you know, that they could be getting it through the nectar. Uh, and the detections in the feathers of owls, gulls, and terns could possibly suggest that the dust, um, you know, that contains the neonic residues could be settling on their feathers and transmitting it that way. And then there are indirect routes of exposure. You're probably familiar with the story of um, uh, DDT and how it passes up through the food chain through what's referred to as, as bioaccumulation. Uh, of course, this is you know what what is led to you know declines in birds like bald eagles. Well, neonicotinoids have long been thought to not do that. It was thought they don't bioaccumulate. Uh, but a number of recent studies you know have detected. Neonics and birds without a known direct exposure. Birds like, you know, honey buzzards, as I said before, the barn owls, these seabirds, and even a salamander uh, that, you know, really the only, you know, the, the, it's the most likely route appears to be that they got it from their prey, their insect or, or other prey. More study is needed, but um, scientists are starting to, to question the previous assumption that there is no bioaccumulation. So now talking about the toxicity. Uh, so a bird you know, comes into contact with neonics in some way. It can have two routes of effects that can be acute or lethal uh, or uh, chronic uh, sublethal toxicity. So acute or lethal effects happen you know, when birds uh, consume or come into contact with enough neonics to reach a threshold uh, of direct mortality. We refer to this as the LD50. It's the concentration at which half the birds exposed to it uh, will, will die, will, there will be mortality. With white crown sparrows, uh, just 14 to 40 canola seeds, and they're, they're shown here, you can see how tiny they are, are enough to contain a lethal dose of imidacloprid. Studies of chaffinches in Europe show that they can consume seeds containing 370% of a lethal dose in a single day. And for northern bobwhites, uh, 20 treated corn seeds can contain a lethal dose. And in France, a number of years ago, uh, 
Scientists had observed dead pigeons and partridges in the midicloprid treated fields and collected some of these birds and detected high levels of the midicloprid in the bird's bloodstream, suggesting a possible link. Uh, there are also a variety of subleaf low effects. So even if the birds don't um, get exposed to enough to cause you know, direct mortality, it, there are many sublethal effects that can impact birds in ways that affect their survival and reproduction, which in turn affects population growth and size. So a couple of famous studies from a few years back showed, uh, worked with white crown sparrows captured in, in Canada during spring migration. And in one of the studies, just 2.5% of the lethal dose led to birds reducing their food intake, uh, losing body mass and fat loss, and delaying their departure, which has carryover effects that leads to, to reduced reproductive success. And in a previous study, uh, dosing them with 10% of their lethal dose led to a 17% body mass loss. And the birds actually oriented in the wrong, wrong direction, suggesting they, unless they corrected, uh, could end up um, you know, in, the, in the wrong location um, when they're trying to get to their breeding grounds. <clears throat> a variety of other sublethal effects have been observed, including reductions in fertilization rate, egg shell thickness, hatching success, there have been developmental abnormalities, reduced adult survival and immune response, testicular degeneration, increased DNA breakage, you know, the list goes on. There's, there's many ways that birds can be affected uh, by neonics, uh, even if they don't actually, you know, uh, cause mortality. So we've been talking about direct effects so far, but there are also indirect effects because of course, neonics are used to produce insects and insects are food for many birds. So going back to the slide, you know, that I showed early in this presentation, uh, you know, in addition to seeing declines in grassland birds, in Canada, the strongest declines are amongst aerial insectivores. And across North America, when you look at the, the groups of birds that most contribute to the 2.9 billion bird loss, almost all of them are at least partially insectivorous. So Dan talked a little bit about the, the insect apocalypse. You know, insects are facing a whole wide range of threats, including pesticides. And as a result, many are declining globally. So we're seeing, uh, you know, 67% of monitored invertebrates have declined by 45% on average. A third of those uh, for which we have population trends are declining. Puerto Rico has seen insects decline 60 fold. Germany has seen 76% declines. And just today, a new paper came out this morning showing that across the globe, intensive agriculture is associated with declines of 50% in insect abundance and 27% in richness. Aquatic macroinvertebrates, I, I mentioned this earlier. Aquatic macroinverts are particularly susceptible to neonic joints. And you can see here, this is showing the sensitivity, the concentrations at which half of the insects exposed to that concentration of insecticide will die. Uh, the ones that are most sensitive that die at the lowest concentrations are chironomids, uh, trichoptera, which are caddisflies, and ephemeroptera, which are mayflies. And these birds are critical components of um, insectivorous bird food supply. And these levels of contamination are incredibly common. Uh, here is surface water samples. These are max concentrations and surface water samples from um, across the world. And 81% of the maximum observed concentrations and 74% of the average exceed the toxicity thresholds for these groups. This is the threshold for coronamid. This is the threshold for mayfly. And same, another study showed the loss of 50% of the diversity of coronamids um, above uh, a fairly low concentration threshold. Okay, so we're seeing these direct effects. We're seeing these declines in you know, uh, bird numbers and mortality and loss of insects, but how is this affecting bird populations? So this is, this is my team's job is detecting population level effects. 
And, and you know, I'm here to tell you that it is really hard uh, to link population trends and drivers. I, I really consider this a holy grail because bird populations are affected by many things uh, that are acting independently as well as interacting with one another. And teasing apart the impacts of multiple drivers is really hard, you know, even when we know mortality is high. And this is particularly true in cases like neonics where the scale of the driver is different from the scale at which trends are assessed, when the impacts are local, when as with neonics, we have you know, really limited data on how much are being used and where. And also, you know, birds may compensate. Uh, for example, with pesticides, they, they may switch to eating untreated seeds or insectivores you know, can eat other, other types of insects that are less impacted. And here's an example of, of um, you know, building collisions, which we know kill hundreds of millions of birds, yet it's just really difficult to link them uh, to population trends as shown here by this lack of, a, lack of a correlation. That said, as hard as this is, uh, two recent studies have linked neonics to bird population trends. Uh, so the first was in the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands has done a fantastic job. They have an amazing um, study design where they sample neonics all across the country and then survey birds at the same locations on the same time scale. And they found that, you know, field reasonable concentrations of neonics are associated with a three and a half percent per year population decline of insectivorous birds. And that insectivorous birds are declining faster in areas with higher excuse me, neonic concentrations. And here, you know, as I said, there's many things that affect birds. How can you rule, rule them out? And so they, they accounted for this here and showed that by far the strongest effects are of the neonics. And then a study that, that Dan referred to uh, from right here in the United States, looked at county level neonicotinoid use and linked it to declines in bird abundance, richness and diversity. And these effects were stronger. Here's uh, reduced abundance in grassland birds in blue relative to non-grassland birds, and also greater declines in abundance in insectivorous birds in blue than non-insectivorous birds in red, as we would expect with, um, with uh, neonic pesticides. So on average, the increases in neonic use between 2008 to 2014, the study's time period, was linked to a 4% annual decline in grassland bird populations and a 3% annual decline in insectivorous bird populations, which is a lot. So in conclusion, uh, neonics are demonstrably impacting birds. Um, birds are exposed to them both directly and indirectly. Uh, concentrations that are just naturally observed in the field are capable of lethal and sublethal effects. Uh, high concentrations have been linked to bird mortality in the lab and possibly in the field. And even without mortality, birds experience a range of sublethal effects that impact their survival, reproduction, and consequently population growth or decline. And neonics have been linked to declining bird populations in the US and the Netherlands. So what, what you can do, um, you can support legislation such as, as the bills that Dan mentioned, seeking to reduce the use of neonic pesticides. Uh, a corollary to that is uh, what we don't want to see happen is that people just switch to other pesticides, some of which can be as or even more harmful. And so instead, uh, we support calls for an integrated pest management approach to reduce you know, total pesticide use. There also are a couple of recent, um, uh, recent links that will be provided to you in the chat uh, that provide great advice on, you know, the first is on seven ways to make your home more bird friendly. And number four here is to plant native plants. And number five is to be a social influence. Talk, talk to your, your friends and family and neighbors about reducing pesticide use. And also the seven simple actions to help birds. Um, uh, one of the, the simple actions there is to avoid pesticides. So there's, you know, it's a scary problem. But there's a lot that you can do. And with that, 
Uh, I'm happy to take any questions here, and this is also how you can find me online. Dr. Michael, thank you very much. Boy, that's an awful lot of robust science there that we that we heard about today, and thanks for providing it. I, I, I know myself, and I think a, a lot of our audience today, is our, our eyes have been opened quite a bit about this, and thanks also for providing some opportunities to maybe do something about it. Before we get to Q&A, um, we did have a comment in the chat from a, from a gentleman who works for the EPA a little while ago, talking about that you know, the workers at the EPA are aware of all of this, but the uh, the power of the of the pesticide lobbies and some indifference from politicians is kind of uh, frustrating any opportunities to make change, um, real real effective change. So, uh, and, I, and I, I'm sure that's part of the conversation we'll have during Q&A, but I wanted to just point that out. Um, and also joining us now is Aaron McGrath. Aaron, uh, my friend, uh, is Audubon New York's policy manager. Hi, Aaron. Um, would you like to kick off the Q&A? Sure, and you read, led right into it, Rich. Um, I wanted to ask Dan first if he could talk a little bit more about what the EPA has done in the past to limit or restrict neonics and about what we might do in the future to help them achieve that goal. Yeah, I, I could talk a, a little bit about that. So um, EPA in the past has not done too, too much to limit neonic use in the mid um, 2010s, around 2014, I think, they put certain labels on neonic containing products um, that put some restrictions on them that you can't spray them around bloom time when bees may be, um, you know, visiting flowers and some other limited restrictions. But, you know, as we discussed in the presentation, the problem with neonics is that they hang around in the environment for very long periods of time and that contamination lasts. And I think sort of the proof has been in the pudding. Uh, the steps that EPA took at that time haven't done anything to improve what we see in the honeybee losses, which is the one place we can really measure those losses, right? We don't have good data for native bees and, and for birds as discussed. Um, EPA right now is going through a process called registration review. Um, they issued a proposed decision at the end of the Trump administration that essentially would allow business as usual when it comes to neonics. And I should explain what registration review is. EPA has to review pesticides every 15 years to make sure that they are up to federal standards, which are a little wishy-washy anyway, but let's not get into that. Um, so that decision we expect will probably be finalized in October of this year. Um, I think uh, the comment period for that, unfortunately, is closed, although people can always email EPA, too. They will get those emails. Um, but, um, yeah, if we see a continuation of the um, proposed decision, if they just approve that and finalize it, um, our organization is prepared to take legal action. Um, so a lot more fighting left to do. But, yeah, I think right now all of this serves to underscore and that comment that Rich mentioned it's really up to the states to take action. And that's what's, that's what's been happening. That's what's happened in New Jersey and Maine. That's what we hope happens in New York and Connecticut and California. Great, thanks, Dan. Nicole, I got a question for you um, that was asked. Um, should we be uh, you know, worried about and uh, concerned about um, commercial bird seed that, that often contains corn? Is that, is that an issue with, with Unix? You know, that's a great question. I know that there was a previous issue with um, uh, seed that was being sold actually under the Audubon name that did contain neonics. Um, I believe that, that, I know there was a lawsuit about that and I believe the result of that is that that's not being done anymore. Um, I'd have to confirm that. I, I would say, you know, uh, if there are still, you know, commercial brood seeds out there that contain neonics, I would certainly avoid them. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, buyer beware, um, you know, so I would just read labels carefully, but I don't, I don't know if that is the case or not. The, the one yeah, thing, Dan. the one thing I would add to that is when they do put the pesticides on the seed, they're required by law to colorize it. That's why they look so, so if you, if you're buying seed that is colorized, I think that's, a, that's a good warning sign. Probably it, it shouldn't be there, but of course, you know, if they have a bunch of seed at the facility, sometimes there's contamination anyway, even uh, if that's not the intention. So 
yeah, buyer beware. Great, thanks. Aaron, before you go, a quick follow-up then to, to Nicole then, and, and you may have mentioned this before and I may have missed it, but someone also asked too, is there a way to tell of uh, the product or a pesticide has neonics in it? Is there a, a warning on there that, said, that specifically says that? Yeah, I mean, typically you do see that warning label that describes what pesticides are in, in any product and, and their concentration. So uh, I would just look for that label. And a similarly related question, and I think this one will be for Dan, is do food labels indicate if they have been raised using neonics and how can we tell and what can we do to avoid neonics in our food? Um, well, so the answer is no, uh, and, and probably most folks would know this, right? If you've been to the grocery store, it doesn't tell you what pesticides your, your food has been grown with. Uh, and, you know, one tricky thing about neonics is because they're designed to permeate plants, if you have an apple, let's say, that's been treated with neonics, it's, the pesticides are in the apple. You can't wash them off. They are infused into the plant. And there are some good studies out that found neonics all over uh, food, including applesauce, baby food, fruits and veggies. Um, the one thing that you can do is you can buy organic food and produce and organic production neonics are not allowed to be used. Um, but again, even some organic food does have neonics in it that was also in the testing at certainly at much, much lower levels. But you know, let's say if you have an organic farm next to a conventional farm, uh, they're irrigating using that same water supply, right? So if that water supply is contaminated, it goes into irrigating with the organic crops, it gets into those crops. So we do see some contamination of organic produce, but again, the, the most surefire way to avoid them is to um, buy organic. Thanks, and another question for you, Dan, and, and maybe Nicole can chime in too, but are there any organic pesticides or, or other pest control methods that um, are financially viable that can replace uh, neonics um, you know, on, a, on, a, on a mass scale for agriculture and other uses? Um, that we can sort of uh, support um, economically and well, legislatively. Well, well, you know, the important thing to note from all of this research that has been done, so the biggest use of neonics nationwide by far are on corn and soybean seeds, you know, less so in Connecticut, more so in New York, certainly in the Midwest. And what the studies are showing us is that economically, these are not providing benefits. As Nicole mentioned, you do get the yield benefit in five to 8% of cases. But then if you look at the extra cost of having the pesticide on the seed versus that benefit, it's a wash. And if you saw in that chart that I had earlier, where the neonic harmfulness takes off, I mean, these pesticides have been around since the mid nineties, but it's not until the mid 2000s that we start seeing their use on corn and soybean seeds. And that's when it takes off like a rocket. So the best replacement there is nothing, right? If they're not providing an economic benefit, we know they are providing a harm, the replacement should be nothing. And you've seen other places shift away from, from neonic use. And again, lawns and gardens are another good place to get rid of these pesticides. Um, in most cases, they are not providing a benefit. There are a number of safer organic alternatives uh, to use. And, you know, if you have a few more bugs in your lawn, maybe that's not such a bad thing compared to the harms that these pesticides produce. Yeah, that, and that's fantastic, Dan. And I would just add too that, you know, there, not only are there other pesticides you could use, uh, you know, some of which are less toxic to insects and birds, but the real problem that as I see it is just the massive amount that is used in, used prophylactically, you know, it's just every seed that you can buy pretty much already is treated. You're not going to need that. There's not, you know, insect outbreaks do not occur at that scale. So what seems to me a smarter way of, um, of approaching this is to, instead of applying it ahead of time to everything, use small amounts in a targeted fashion as needed. We've had a few questions. I think you guys touched on this, but it'd be great if we could provide a little more clarification, maybe starting with Dan. Um, a couple of folks have been asking about the plants that are sold at local nurseries. Um, are those raised with neonics and is there any way to tell if they have or haven't been? Um, so 
yes is the answer. They definitely are. And I, I think even most of them uh, would be. Uh, I think, it, again, an organic nursery, they would not be able to use neonics. You can't use neonics in organic production. I know there was some movement to phase away from use of neonics. A number of retailers said that they would try to phase that out of their supply chains. I don't know what the status of that is. And you would likely not know whether the plant that you had bought is, is treated with neonic or not, again, unless you, you bought and from an organic nursery. Great, thanks. Um, this is a great dialogue, but we're only um, we're rapidly approaching five o'clock. We probably only have time for one more question. Um, and we've got a lot of questions in the chat. We're not gonna get to all of them. So if, if anyone has a burning question we haven't gotten to, I'm gonna drop in the chat now the uh, email addresses for uh, Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York. You can send us your question. We'll pass them along to, to uh, Nicole or Dan and, uh, and um, keep this conversation going, but um, thank you. So we'll take this one last question and it's for Nicole. Um, you know, we talk about the 3 billion birds lost since the 1970s. Um, were bird populations relatively stable before then or has the decline really started since 1970? Boy, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And it's one we really have struggled to have the answer to just because there's not a lot of data. That said, um, yeah, Audubon's Christmas Bird Camp is the longest running uh, community science program, uh, certainly in North America. And we did just publish a paper uh, earlier this year showing uh, population trends over, over 90 years um, of birds in the, the Eastern United States. And we are seeing long-term declines uh, linked to both climate and to land cover change. You know, there was, there was massive change in land cover in the early 1900s across the East, uh, forest loss and, and then regrowth. And so we know that impacted birds. We just have limited ability to um, document it. Thank you, doctor. Well, that's about all the time we have, but um, what a fantastic eye-opening opportunity we all had today. You know, when it said, when you said Silent Spring in the title and, and, and Dan mentioned the beginning, um, maybe some of us thought that might've been a bit of hyperbole, but this is certainly something very akin to, to um, the seminal work, Silent Spring and, and DDT and, and, and the threats that it has to everything in our, in our systems, not just birds and bees, but everything. And, um, so we got a lot of work to do and a lot more conversations, all of us to have. So thank you for starting that for many of us. Um, and thanks again for joining us, um, Dr. Michael and Dan. Thank you. And thanks, Aaron. Um, we'll be we're going to take uh, the webinar series. We'll be taking off the month of May during our Birdathon season and some events. But uh, we'll be back in June on June 15th as uh, Corey Folsom O'Keefe and some of her colleagues will present on coastal stewardship. So look, uh, look for that. Um, uh, invitation in your email in the coming weeks and this has been recorded and uh, all the participants will receive an email in a couple days with a link to the recording and links to uh, opportunities to uh, uh, you know sign petitions and do some other things so thanks again everyone and have a great rest of your day <laughs>